Thanks a lot for coming back for uh, part two. Let's continue with the build. And at this point, I was still working on the garage roof. I had a temporary covering on there. Made myself a little uh, a little key holder for my Pontiac keys. <laughs> at this point, I decided if I didn't have enough problems in my life, I was going to buy myself a four-poster ramp from an old garage. So I didn't have enough room. As you can see, my cars are everywhere. So I needed to have a shuffle round. So we, we fitted this ramp in my garage so we could lift the Jaguar. You can see on this photo, there it is. Look, it goes up on the ramp so I can get it out the way. That's now sold that car. I lost my love for it and it's gone. My friend Will helped me out a lot because it was a, a free phase electrics. There's the chap I sold it to. You can see things have moved on fairly quickly. This is moving over the years. Yeah, push rods, they sent me the wrong ones, which is a pain. We're back to the engine here. Um, this is before it was sprayed, obviously. You can see we jump, we jump sequence there on the photos a little bit, getting everything right. Oh, yeah, I, I, I separated the water from the, you'll see it here, move away. There we go. Look, I separated the water from the manifold. This is quite handy because it, it can actually fit better and you keep the hot water away from the cool inlet. This is me undercoating all of the, um, the engine parts. You can see there, that's the fuel pump. It was the original one, I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> Washing stuff in the sink when the missus wasn't there, ready for spraying. And the correct set of push rods coming through. Again, I have to come through for the US, you get charged for that. There they are, push rods fitted. Everything torqued down, it all went okay. Everything on. There we go. There's me spraying stuff. I made a, a booth in the log cabin, which is where I'm talking from now. Getting everything ready. There was all stuff everywhere. This this paint, it, it, it only cures at temperature. You can see me preparing the block there. Um, so it only really cures when you start the engine for the first time. So there it is in the uh, the high temperature primer. Uh, there's the uh, the Tomahawk. Uh, that's not a Winges tray. That's the, uh, the the Valley tray. You can see there I've moved stuff around. The Catalina has been sold. We've got more room. There we go. It's in top coat. Had to wait for the weather to be warm enough. You can see the axle on the floor there as well. Yeah, I found a fault with the gearbox here. Um, my friend in Finland sent me that book very kindly. So, of course, this was going on at the same time. I was multitasking. So, yeah, had my son come in when I was fitting the engine together. He's a good lad. Then he got he got excited when all the boxes came through. He wanted to sort of, that's the new radiator coming through for the US. Brought a load of um, all kinds of auxiliaries there. You can see the wheel bearings and stuff. There's the, uh, the pulleys that I painted in black. I think the satin black was the right colour. I had to grind off the edges to this, uh, this, this I forgot the name, it's a valley tray. There you go, you can see things are starting to take shape in the garage now, the Trans Am's coming together. Shiny stuff. There's a grim of, the grin of something actually working. Um, right, so answers to questions. The smoke was coming out the end of the drill. Um, it smelled oily because this drill's been used for oily stuff, so the oily smell was not the um, dizzy drive burning, which is great, but this is even better. I did what Adam said and I span it at a slow steady speed and within a few seconds it started coming out and there's definitely oil pressure there because it, it keeps sort of coming out for a while. I've checked in every single one. This side is where I tipped it to see a little bit more. You can see the oil coming out of the, um, of the push rod thingies. I'm not, I'm not used to these Pontiac, I mean, I'm used to Jaguar dual overhead cam but yeah that's, that's some oil. Uh, quite how to get the gauge working, don't know. Cross that bridge and come to it. But hey, that's job one done for today. Basic oil pressure. So you can see they've got the oil pressure running. Then put the water in it on the cradle. Um, so now I am a bit worried. Um, I'm convinced I've now done something wrong. So what I've done is I've turned the engine to 18 before top dead centre, which is on the dial there. You can see the groove. There's a groove in the pulley. And that comes round to there. The only problem is that when I turn it to there, I put the distributor in. Oh, and what I've done is put my thumb over there and it sort of pushes my thumb off with, 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 with the compression. So I think that's the compression stroke, if that's pushing up. But with this is number one, with a blue cable tie on it. If you look at that, yeah, that's clearly not number one on the distributor. You can see it's there seems to be pointing at number two. Now I can't get this any because it hits on there. This drives me nuts. So 
I've either done something catastrophically wrong or I've misunderstood no. something. I don't really get why, why that's I so far really off. Maybe it's something obvious wrong. that I'm missing, but I mean, if that is one, then it's I'm, I'm at number two when it should be at number one. I don't really understand how that could be. Even with all the movement, it, it will only go the wrong way. A uh, huge, massive, massive thanks to Tony for giving me a call. Um, I'm not really sure what the difference is, but anyway, look, timing mark at the 18 where it should be. Tony said, take it out, jiggle it, put it back in, take it out, put it back in, which just seemed completely illogical. But however, I've taken it out, I've put it back in, and now suddenly, look, one, one is lining up, and there is enough room once that's seated correctly that it will advance and retard. So I, I really don't understand, but Tony's magic fix and his soothing Welsh tones <laughs> resolved it. So many thanks, appreciate that. I, I'm not sure I understand why it now fits, but in and out a few times and it seems to work. Lovely job. Cheers, guys. To this day, I'm not really sure why that worked, but it did. Run the engine for the first time, and you can see here, not good. Um, it turns out that I didn't have the heads on quite properly, one of the heads anyway, and you can see there's a little bit of leakage there. It was the, there's these little dowels that stick up and I hadn't pushed the dowel far enough down. I got pulled over again, my friend, and he came up with a conclusion that it was the dowels. There's the engine on the test bed where you have to uh, break in the engine. So, this is where things went a little bit wrong. Um, it just wouldn't start to begin with. You can see the Jag there on the ramp. The hearse is parked outside by the looks of it. And, uh, at the time, my, my, my 911 is parked underneath the jack. It's my friend Chris, who helped out quite a lot this time, very grateful for his help. That was... Oh, started to go. Apologies for my bottom in the centre of the screen. It, it will move quickly. <laughs> Fly up! <laughs> yeah. Tipping Petra in the carburetor, not the cleverest thing I ever did. But as you'll see uh, in a minute, things didn't go very well at this point. I, um, I, I, I got quite bad. I ended up in, in, in hospital. Um, turns out that, that my thyroid had failed and um, it had led to some bad judgment calls. Uh, when your thyroid fails, you, you lose the ability to think clearly and you have all kinds of problems. Um, and it got me quite badly injured. And there's the engine running for the first time.
I'm shouting at Chris for probably the engine timing strobe or, or something there. We've got it going. If only I could tell myself here not to have the accident I'm about to have. Um, the accident wasn't actually filmed, um, for those of you that are a bit sick. It happens off screen, um, off, not, not, not on video. Unfortunately, I knocked the, um, the cap off the radiator. Um, and I got quite seriously burnt. The, the radiator effectively blew up in my face and shot boiling steam everywhere, took all my skin off. Um, fortunately, because it was boiling hot water um, and superheated steam, it just literally burnt all the skin off and my skin grew back. I looked a bit gruesome for a few days, but you'll see the photos in a minute. So yeah, it, it kept overheating and I couldn't work out why it overheated. Um, and as time went on, I put different fans in there and couldn't work out why. I mean, this was hellishly noisy, so I did have some silences on there. This was so noisy. I think what Chris is checking there is the temperature of the radiator, because it's probably about to overheat. In fact, it does overheat. I don't know if we're going to show it overheating here. But this, this was really upsetting. After all the time and effort, it basically just turned out that you can't run one of these engines at, at what, 1500 RPM for 20 minutes on the test bed, or I didn't have the right equipment to do it. I know people do do it, but it's never it's never overheated or even come close since I've been driving it in the last year. So I know that this was just pure bad luck that it that it overheated on the on the thing. It didn't damage anything other than me. I was quite pleased that it was running at this point, thinking that every, all the work I put into it. Bearing in mind this this engine was seized completely solid, um, so I painted it up, put it in. I think I found a core plug leaking at the back. Just one core plug gave it a couple of taps with the hammer. And it was fine. Um, you can see there's a bit of smoke coming out here. Here we go, look. I think they're starting to overheat. It looks from memory anyway. In fact, even just the smell of steam these days makes me, that kind of feeling of steam just makes me, oh, recoil. It's really painful. Ended up going to hospital in, in you know, blue light trip hospital in the ambulance. It wasn't great. Oh, yeah, man, that did sound good. So like proper V8. But this is trying to break the cam in, right? So an American V8, you need to, um, you need to break the cam in, you've got to run it for what, 15 minutes at 1400 RPM because there isn't enough oil going onto the cam lobes if you let it just tick over. So you can't let it tick over, you have to have it 1500. And unfortunately, so we, 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 we had what, two or three attempts at this? Um, you can see there's lots of smoke coming out and it's starting to boil up, it's starting to get hot. So at this point, I think I had the, I had, I had the stainless steel exhaust on a on a on a wooden. It was a hard wood block, and unfortunately, it started to catch fire. So I think Chris is just gently putting the fire out. There's me just slightly moving the uh, the exhaust away so it stays away from there. I slightly burnt my hand on the exhaust at this point. Remember, I wasn't in in good mental state here because my thyroid. I was just starting the treatment, and I hadn't realised how much it damaged me. I pretty much lost my job. Um, and yeah, it, it cost me very dear to be mentally unstable at this point. Um, it's, it's hard watching back at some of these videos and the, the, the decisions I made and the things I did, but there we go. There you go, here we go, it's starting to overheat by the looks of it. I think we're going to shut it down any second. But remember, at this, at this stage, the car still needs lots of work done to it. I've got bits going to the machine shop, I've got bits going to the... Um, the shot blasters, I've got all kinds of stuff going on. It would just be nice to get one bit going. But you can hear it's getting hot now. Uh, I can't remember how long that's been running for, but it's a little while. So that, that radiator came from eBay. That was um, an aluminium, I believe they're made in China or India. Aluminium radiator, um, not quite twice the capacity, but they are bigger than the standard. And because I come from a Jaguar background where they pretty much always overheat and it's always a bit dicky, I thought I'd fit the bigger radiator. But it's never even come close to overheating on the road, no matter how heavy the traffic is or, or what's going on. You can hear we're still we're still running in to try and get to that 15, that golden sort of 15, 20 minutes of running at 14, 1500. See, Chris is monitoring the uh, the heat there. Um, we get in there. I, well, that's what I'm thinking. Of course, I'm trying to vary the revs a bit because it says when you when you run it in, you should vary the revs. Of 
got an aftermarket um, alternator on there because the original one was completely goosed and I couldn't get an original looking one, I had to get that one with the chrome front on it again sorry for my bottom in frame just getting hot now this, this is where we should probably talk about the Rochester carburetor very briefly so I spent a long long time cleaning this carburetor buying um, buying reconditioning kits for it. I spent so long trying to get the carburetor working. In the end, I just gave up. Um, Tony, Tony, who gave me the advice, he got me, that, that hose is getting quite hot by the way, um, Tony loaned me a, a carburetor to do this with, so this is Tony's carburetor. And I couldn't get that to run particularly well either, to be honest, and I was trying to work out, is it me and the engine, or is it the actual carburetor itself? So I rebuilt Tony's carburetor with another kit. There we go, that's just turning it off because it, it overheated. And I just couldn't get the Rochester to run right. And I know people say the Rochester's are great carburetors, and I'm sure they are. And if there's one on your car, good for you. I'm sure it's great. But I just could not get it to get it to work properly on the car. At any revs, it wouldn't tick over. It kept stalling. I just I just lost my temper with it. And the, the, buying the Edelbrock was probably the best thing I ever did, to be honest. The car ran. As soon as I bolted the Edelbrock on, the, the car just ran so much better immediately. And even with a little bit of tweaking, it ran even better. I mean, the car still isn't perfect you know, when it comes to idling. I was a bit high, but... Yeah, I think we're trying to trace where the, where the water and steam is coming from. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not messing with the water jacket at this point. So I think there was a few drips of water coming out. Yeah. So that's the leaking core plug I mentioned. I just gave that a few taps with a hammer and it sorted it out straight away actually. Yeah, don't mess with that side. That's what leads to trouble. Yeah, so it did overheat. Um, this is where things went a little bit bad. Yeah, that's the burn on my hand where I accidentally knocked it off. I ended up in hospital. Um, very grateful for the NHS who came out very quickly. You can see there where it burned the skin off my face. I was so, so lucky. It missed my eyes, burnt my jacket. And I didn't go back in the garage for a good few weeks. When I eventually went back in there, I took this photo of the aftermath. Um, it burnt the ceiling. Um, it was a foolish, silly thing to do. Um, I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky I wasn't hurt. Eventually got over it. This is where I met my friend James, still a friend to this day. Um, and we started fitting the engine into the car. We couldn't get the headers on. It was a nightmare. But yeah, we eventually, after lifting the engine in about God knows how many times, we so eventually spent ages engine. trying to work out where these trans lines run. And I, I guess the only place you can see they're there, they're the cooler lines, the two silver pipes come out of there, they go behind the oil filter, they go underneath the engine, underneath the engine mount, and then come out here. That's the only way that seems logical. I could spend all day doing this, and I just don't know. I've searched the internet, I've looked absolutely everywhere, I cannot find any diagrams, any pictures, anything. So if anyone has any info, that would be really helpful. Yeah, eventually got them in. Turned out I was right. You can see here fitting all the uh, all the stuff in. Yeah, my original air filter was knackered, like like the rest of the car. Managed to find myself a second hand one. There it is. Much better condition. That's on the car now. Managed to get myself the uh, the guide for where the um, I think it's a negative terminal goes, or is it positive? I can't remember. Has <laughs> Fred coming back in the garage and helping me again? Of course, he's what, five or six? He's eight now. Um, at this point, I also decided to tidy up the garage and I brought myself some big tool cabinets to get everything off the floor. Oh, then I got a nice bit of skin cancer. That stopped things for a bit. Had the skin cancer cut out, then carried on with the car. Um, that's the uh, washer bottle going in. Oh, grief with the washer bottle. There's the uh, overflow for the um, radiator. Gents, I spent quite a lot of time Googling this yesterday and I still can't find a satisfactory answer. So there's two heater connections that come out from the heater box. There's that one there, and there's this one that I've connected the pipe to before the wing went on. I don't know which one goes where. Now, I know they can go either way because it's a heater matrix and it flows both ways. 
but I'd like to know how it should be wired, how it should be run. So should it be bottom to the front, or should it be top to the front and bottom to the back? Because one of them goes to that, that, that nipple there, which is the, there. But I don't know which one it is, goes to that. Is it that one to the back? Or that one to the front, as as designed. Not really sure how the cables run either. I assume they just sort of cables. Why? Uh, how the um, hoses run? I assume they just go like that. I don't know. Any uh, any info? Gratefully received. I think I took a consensus of my mates and went with the the most the most popular run of cables. Okay, so I then had to bend the um, the transmission shifting rod to fit it around the headers, and this was a pain. I spent a long time with my mate Will trying to get this right, because of course, uh, there you go, you can see the bend I've put in that rod. So remember that the um, the column shift so is connected, as Will you see here. and James, I've got the bits here, and I can turn the shifter that way. It's on the and side of the gearbox under the car. You're not there to see it, are you? And hopefully you can see it moving there and it misses so i've had to bend it to make it miss but just i mean it sort of clanks i can bend just it a bit more to fit in there the problem is that this rod i mean maybe it's because the steering column's not the right position but this rod is like miles away it's literally like a mile off bend it side give it a good bend the and steering column position at the moment but isn't hindsight really a long way thing. off hey at this point brought myself a new car my life was changing, my, and I brought myself a Harley. My life was changing, I got a new job, everything was much better. The treatment was working. The engine was in the car. Starting to add everything in. Oh, exhaust, what a nightmare. <sighs> I tried to fit the exhaust myself, I was completely unable to. So I took it to a local garage. So this was the state of the car when I took it to the local garage. Um, I laid out all the exhausts and um, the local garage fitted it on for me. Oh, Rochester. Not even going to talk about it. Let's, let's, let's just let's just skip this photo. There's the car in the garage. Unfortunately, this garage, they had a guy turn up sick and they threw my car off the ramp and I had to take it to this place. And these guys very kindly fitted the exhaust for me, um, which managed, you know, which, which kind of got me on the road. Very grateful for the help that I got from them. Then took it from an MOT once I had an exhaust. That's the temporary number plate on there I got. There's me again messing with the Rochester. Oh, I just spent so much time on that. Just couldn't get it to run no matter what I did. Just so much time. Hi guys, quick video update. So where we're at, the car will drive beautifully. You know, it will accelerate, it will kick down. You know, it really goes and it sounds amazing, but it won't tick over very well. And it will stall if you put it in reverse or it, when you first put it in drive and go slowly. So that generally means there's a vacuum leak. And the fix, the fix at the moment to make it run is to raise the revs. But what I don't want is the revs at around 1,500 or 1,200 to drive to bandit running. Because if I'm stuck in traffic, idling at that high amount will be a complete pain. So what we need to do is fix the carburetor. So let's think about what we've been doing. I've spent like two evenings in the garage now until gone 11 o'clock. Last night with James and, sorry, the night before with James and last night with Will. We've been doing lots of work. Now... Will is convinced there's something wrong with the idle circuits on my carburetor. So we took them out and we cleared them through. It's down there, it's all been cleared. And bear in mind, I've already re rebuilt this. There's nothing wrong with any of those bits. However, what Will did find, and this is critical, is there's a huge amount of slot in this. I don't know if the camera can get it. And you can see that moving. There's a huge amount of play in the, in the bushing here. So this is leaking air, most likely. And that would cause all my problems. That's highly likely to be the issue. Problem is, I probably can't get the bushings in the UK, and they're like a 10-day, you know, from the USA. So I'm going to have an ask around today to see if I can get some. So couldn't get them. Sort of all of them from the US. Is to use Anthony's carburetor that he's loaned me. I can put it back on. It's not quite the right carburetor. This one does also have quite a lot of play in the bushings. So I might be swapping bad for almost as bad, but it's not as bad as mine. So I've got nothing to lose by sticking Anthony's back on and trying it. It was marginally better. Marginally. Anthony's carburetor is um, a federal one with emissions regulation. So what I've had to do is turn down a, a socket on my lathe to make it small enough to fit in the hole. But anyway, we, we have a way ahead. I'm extremely tired, but I'm going to phone my local machine shop to see if they're able to, to do anything with these, with these bushings like, you know, for not too much money rather than wait for the US but they were not able to 
Thank you. So that was the answer. It was to buy the Edelbrock. Um, is, it, is it EVS2 or there you go, AVS2 Edelbrock. Oh, put it on. Car ran perfectly pretty much immediately. Um, initially, it wouldn't t it, it wouldn't tick over much less than 1300 to begin with. But after a bit of tweaking, I can now get the tick over just under a thousand. And there she's running. Never overheats. Doesn't really stall anymore. I, I'd like to bring the tick over down a little bit. Remember, I haven't been running it for that long. So, overall, that's a victory to get the engine running. What we now need to do is start looking at the body and all of the work that went into the body and the rebuild of that. There's a lot, a lot of work. And not something I've got a lot of um, experience with, so this was a complete learning experience for me. But there's the shaker shaking around as it's supposed to. So thanks a lot for coming back for part two. Again, broadband issues mean that I've got to upload this and move on to the next part. So um, join us in part three for the rest of the build. Many thanks.